Hi, I'm Siobhan and welcome to Angelman Academy. We hope you enjoy this course. Please join our mailing list and stay tuned for the latest offerings to support individuals with Angelman Syndrome. Hi, I'm Kata Hearns and today's um, course is on starting out with AAC or perhaps for some of you starting over with AAC. If you've um, tried to do some AAC before and find yourself needing to um, start fresh. This session is a follow-up to Introduction to AAC, and it should give you the tools to implement augmentative and alternative communication in your home um, with a parent or a caregiver um, being the person who is making it happen. This course is also appropriate for teachers and therapists who are really wondering how to start out with augmentative communication with a child with Angelman syndrome or an adult with Angelman syndrome. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is robust augmentative and alternative communication. So augmentative and alternative communication as we covered in the previous course is any communication system which replaces or extends the verbal and other natural communications that an individual has. Um, there are lots of things out there about using picture symbols or making boards and, and lots of people um, see different things out there in different apps and they wonder what are we talking about when we say robust augmentative and alternative communication. And we really believe and many people in the field believe that everybody has a right to, to robust augmentative and alternative communication. That um, every individual has the right to as many words as they can see and touch on their screen or um, perceive and access, if you will, on their communication system screen. This applies to both um, high-tech and um, non-electronic communication systems. So what do we mean? We mean that motor planning is supported by consistent vocabulary placement. So that means that your body learns where things are because they don't move around, they don't change shape or size. The button is always in the same place on every page. Now there are some systems that are put the emphasis on motor planning, such as LAMP or Unity, and then there are other systems where there's less of an emphasis on motor planning. But all of them have some, all of the, the really great systems out there have some um, notice of motor planning, keeping things like the message bar and clear and go back in the same place. Um, so things stay in the same place. The way to think about this is to think about touch typing or to think about dialing a phone. Um, and you know, if you're old enough to remember actually having to dial and not just telling Siri to, to call somebody, but your body remembers where things are. So if you think about your first phone number, and you try to dial it, you're able to do that without even um, thinking consciously about the numbers. Your body knows the patterns of where things are. Maybe you're like me and your first phone number went like that. Um, but that's motor planning. That's your body remembering things without conscious thought and be it becomes automatic. So you're looking for a system that will support that. And then we're looking about an expandable vocabulary, allowing the vocab to grow as skills improve. So this means you can add buttons, you can add pages, you can add sections. Um, it means that you can hide things, hide buttons or make them not visible and then reveal them when they're mastered. Um, but hopefully the child also has a way to go in and explore buttons and just babble and, and play with language. Um, if you find a system that is not thought out well enough, that there is a future there, um, and it's just, you know, somebody put eight pictures on a page and you're calling it a system, that's not expandable because there's no thought to where will things go underneath and how will you teach this. You want a system where you can see the end and your ultimate dream for communication right from the moment when you start. Um, the next thing is grammar is supported, including verb tenses, declensions, superlatives, so um, best, better, um, so declensions, so your different noun forms, um, so book, books, um, our books, your books, their books, um, and verb tenses, I saw, I see, 
I have seen. Um, and of course, a new user may not be ready for these things. The point is they're there when they are ready. Um, and they're there for you to model with the system and to show how it works. Every robust system also has the alphabet um, because there are just too many words in the English language to fit into any system. You know, a lot of systems um, brag about having 10,000 or 15,000 words um, on, their, on their system, but there are hundreds of thousands of words in the English language. So it doesn't matter how many words are on the system. If you can't spell, you can't say anything you want. And that's the whole point of communication, to say whatever you want to say. So, um, and many people in the field believe that everybody has a right to, to robust augmentative and alternative communication, that um, every individual has the right to as many words as they can see and touch on their screen or um, perceive and access, if you will, on their communication system screen. This applies to both um, high-tech and um, non-electronic communication systems. So what do we mean? We mean that motor planning is supported by consistent vocabulary placement. So that means that your body learns where things are because they don't move around, they don't change shape or size. The button is always in the same place on every page. Now there are some systems that are put the emphasis on motor planning, such as LAMP or Unity. And then there are other systems where there's less of an emphasis on motor planning. But all of them have some, all of the, the really great systems out there have some um, notice of motor planning, keeping things like the message bar and clear and go back in the same place. Um, so things stay in the same place. The way to think about this is to think about touch typing or to think about dialing a phone, um, and you know, if you're old enough to remember actually having to dial and not just telling Siri to, to call somebody, but your body remembers where things are. So if you think about your first phone number and you try to dial it, you're able to do that without even um, thinking consciously about the numbers. Your body knows the patterns of where things are. Maybe you're like me and your first phone number went like that. Um, but that's motor planning, that's your body remembering things without conscious thought, and it becomes automatic. So you're looking for a system that will support that. And then we're looking about an expandable vocabulary, allowing the vocab to grow as skills improve. So this means you can add buttons, you can add pages, you can add sections. Um, it means that you can hide things, hide buttons or make them not visible and then reveal them when they're mastered. Um, but hopefully the child also has a way to go in and explore buttons and just babble and, and play with language. Um, if you find a system that is not thought out well enough, that there is a future there, um, and it's just, you know, somebody put eight pictures on a page and you're calling it a system, that's not expandable because there's no thought to where will things go underneath and how will you teach this. You want a system where you can see the end and your ultimate dream for communication right from the moment when you start. Um, the next thing is grammar is supported, including verb tenses, declensions, superlatives, so um, best, better, um, so declensions, so your different noun forms, um, so book, books, um, our books, your books, their books, um, and verb tenses, I saw, I see, I have seen. Um, and of course, a new user may not be ready for these things. The point is they're there when they are ready. Um, and they're there for you to model with the system and to show how it works. Every robust system also has the alphabet um, because there are just too many words in the English language to fit into any system. You know, a lot of systems um, brag about having 10,000 or 15,000 words um, on, their, on their system, but there are hundreds of thousands of words in the English language. So it doesn't matter how many words are on the system. If you can't spell, you can't say anything you want. And that's the whole point of communication, to say whatever you want to say. So um, hopefully the spelling will also have, if it's an electronic system, will have letter, word, and phrase prediction. Um, and it will have some spelling correction, so allow for some inventive spelling 
um, and the word may show up in the word prediction. A robust system also has some pre-programmed home messages for fast-moving social occasions and emergency situations. Now, there shouldn't be a ton of these. There shouldn't be um, pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of full sentences. Um, these are for things that happen repeatedly or that are an emergency um, and that move quickly. So an example would be you want um, a child to be able to go through the lunch line quickly. Um, you don't want to hold up the whole school with a child making sentences. So you might want just that page set up in a way where it's just a couple hits to say everything they need to say. Of course, you need to think about that. Most kids don't necessarily talk as they move through a lunch line. They just point. Um, and if that's what's natural for the situation, then you, you may want to allow the child to do what's natural. Um, an example I always use is when you go to the pharmacy. If you go to the pharmacy, you say that certain things are run over. Hi, my name is, I'm here to pick up X number of prescriptions. My birth date or street address is, um, no, my copayment shouldn't be $10,000. Um, so those, those are things that you may want to set up for an individual who's going in to pick up their own medication at a pharmacy or is learning how to do that. You don't want them holding up the whole line while they tap out each word in that, that, those messages. You want it set up in a way to do that quickly. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to be over-reliant on this. There are some systems out there that you know, have topics or categories pages that are all phrases. You want to avoid that. Um, as much as possible, you, you need some user-generated messages where they put the words together and they learn language and they learn how words work. Um, but the pre-program messages are really important for those times when you just need to move faster or it's an emergency and you don't have time to tap out each word. And finally, most of the words there are core words and they're available in a large number with all parts of speech and word types um, represented. So core words are the words that make up most of what we say. They're words like you, can, go, more, and, under, on, through, look, see, wait, um, he, she, when, where. They're the words that make up practically everything we say. And what we want our individuals to be able to do who use AAC is to combine core words in unique ways to say whatever they want to say. Um, you can say almost everything you want to say with a combination of core words and spelling. Um, but there, there are also words that are not core and are um, important to us, and they're called fringe words. That's what we call those words that don't make up 80% of what we say. They're very specific words that mean a very specific thing like comb or refrigerator or, um, you know, the name of your favorite doll or your favorite action figure. Those things are, are important should also be in systems um, because you can't set context without fringe words. So, you know, if the word American Girl Doll um, or if the word, um, trying to think of other favorite toys I've seen, um, if, you know, if those words aren't there, if the name of your favorite um, musician isn't there, if you can't say Bruno Mars or Uptown Funk, you can ask for music all you want, but it doesn't mean much if you can't ask for the song that you want. So you, you need these fringe words, too. They go hand in hand. Core words might be 80% of what we say, but what we say can't really tell us all that much unless we have that other 20% of fringe words, and you're looking for a system that has both, that has lots and lots of core words, but also has uh, the fringe words and allows you to put in your child's very specific words that they need. Um, for a child who has a lot of healthcare needs, they might have words um, about those healthcare needs, words about seizures or words about um, their stomach bothering them or, or those sorts of things that might happen. Those are important fringe words for that child. For a child who loves um, sports, you're going to want words about, you know, football or soccer. 
um, those are those fringe words that you want. So a robust AAC system has all of these things. It has motor planning, an expandable vocabulary, it has grammar, an alphabet, pre-programmed full messages that are for those fast moving or emergency situations, and, um, and lots of core words with plenty of fringe words too. Let's talk a little bit about vocabulary arrangement. Um, so I talked about this a little bit in the last course in Intro to AAC, um, but let me just go over what the different setups are and why it's important to know that. So the first arrangement that you might have would be something like touch chat with word power or prologo to go. Um, these are systems where the words are arranged categorically. So you're going to look for the word under the category. So if you're looking for a person word, like mailman, or I guess mail carrier we say now, right? Showing my age. Um, or if you're looking for um, the name of your favorite food, you're going to go to people for the people words and food for the food words or things and then food for the food words. Um, so those are things that are arranged up by category. Now, for those of us who already have language in our brains, you know, we, we already understand how words works. We understand um, how words are categorized. We understand what a verb is and what a noun is. Um, these systems might feel like they make the most sense. Um, and a, a lot of times caregivers feel more comfortable with this kind of system. Um, and that's totally fine. Um, a categorical arrangement of vocabulary is a absolutely fine option for how to set up the words. The important is you're going to pick what works for your child and for your family um, and for your team. Um, but of course the most person per, the important person in all of this is, is your child, what's going to work for them. The next option is a semantic arrangement of words. So that's like the LAMP app or um, anything um, in Unity on the PRC devices, which is a company that that makes um, dedicated speech devices. So not apps that go on computers, but um, whole systems that you, you purchase. Um, so semantic words are arranged with the same part of speech in the same place on every page. Um, and then they're set up by word association. So you see this teeny tiny one I have right here. If you were to hit apple and then go here to where the spot for color is, you would get red. Um, so it's just a, a matter of combining these pictures to make words. So instead of go, looking by category, you would learn the motor pattern and learn where things are based on word association. They teach you little stories about each symbol to um, help you understand what is under that symbol when you touch it. Um, the next kind of system I'm going to talk about is a pragmatic system and that would be when you sort of at the beginning of a pragmatic system so this is something like pod which is pragmatic organization of dynamic display um pod comes as a, a book and as an app or on a computer system um pod is arranged pragmatically so by purpose or um in a, in a practical way so in POD, you, you state your purpose for speaking before you state your message at first. Later on with the system, you don't have that quite as much. Um, but when you're in the beginning levels, 9 or 15 or 20 um, buttons, then that's, that's your, how you do it. You, you state your purpose first. And this makes a lot of sense to kids who are, are just learning language. Um, individuals with Angelman syndrome oftentimes um, this makes a lot of sense to them. So you might say, I'm asking a question, and then when, when it goes to the next page, it would say, what's happening, or who, or where? Um, or you'd say, um, I think that's um, awesome, or I think that's nasty, or um, something's wrong, I'm tired, something's wrong, I'm grumpy, or I have an idea, let's listen to music. So things like that, um, I'll arrange very, very practically um, in order to help scaffold or support the language learning system. And the last way that things might be set up would be alphabetical. Um, there aren't many systems on the market right now that are arranged alphabetically. Um, there's a system called literacy, 
where the AAC in the middle of literacy is actual AAC, so it's literacy with the AAC in the middle, um, which was by the Toby Dynavox system um, on the communicator software, but it wasn't, it didn't happen to um, take off in the, in the US the way it did in, in countries like Germany. But that's a system where it, you search by letter. So if you wanna say Apple, you just touch the A and then you look to the section with nouns and, and hopefully Apple's there. And if it isn't, you touch the next letter in order to build the word. Um, like I said, not many options for that out there right now. There are some within um, a lot of these systems. So within Proloco to Go and Touch Chat with Word Power and some of the others, you'll find some alphabetical arrangement. So today I was working with a child and she was looking for the word rough. Now, if you were in pod, you would say you would go to categories describing words touch rough, but she was using word power. So she had to go to describing words and then A to Z, letter R, and then the word rough was there. Um, it may have also been somewhere else, but um, the quickest way for us to find it was a to Z and then R, and she's learning to read in her letter sounds, so it was a, a good way to teach her about the sound in the word rough. Um, in Proloco to Go, you could do it the same way. You could go to describing words A to Z, R, or you could go describing words, um, I think it's feels? No. It might also be touch. Um, and then you would find the word rough. So a lot of the systems are somewhat a hybrid system. All right, so let's assume now that, you know, you've learned about the way systems are arranged, you understand that you want to have that robust system for your child, and at some point, you pick something. Um, so you might just say, I'm going to bite the bullet, I'm buying Proloco, or I'm going to bite the bullet, I'm going to go to a pod training and make a pod book, or uh, everybody in my school system uses LAMP, so we're just going to use LAMP. Um, because then I'll have a lot of support from the school team. Um, whichever one of these you decide, uh, again, I am not, I think you pick the one that's right for you and there's no best system. Um, but let's say that you've done that. You've gone out there, you bought the system, you play with it a little, little, you're a little overwhelmed now. Um, you're thinking, what do I do with this? Um, oh my gosh. So let's talk about a way that we can scaffold um, moving forward with that system you just got. Um, as we all know, it's not enough to just go out and make a book or buy an app or buy a, a system and hand it to your child and expect that they're going to start talking to you with it. Um, nobody learns language that way. If you were a live audience right now, I'd probably ask you to raise your hand if you studied a foreign language in high school. And if we were in the U.S., um, I've only ever done this in the U.S. and Canada, and in both places, everybody raises their hand. Um, but in the U.S., my follow-up question is always, and how many of you are fluent now? And frequently, it's, it's less than 1% of people in the room who keep their hand up. Um, and so we know, because we've all lived it, that 180 days a year for 45 minutes to an hour a day for four years is not enough to learn a language. Yet we somehow think that if we pull out our EAC system during speech therapy and maybe one or two other times a week or just at circle time, um, that somebody will learn the system. But we know that doesn't work. We all live that. That's not how people learn language. You learn language by living the language. If you want to become fluent in Spanish, you need to move somewhere where they speak Spanish or you need to put yourself in a situation where you hear Spanish all the time. That's how you're really going to learn it. Most people who are fluent in a second language, lived that language. So they either grew up somewhere else and moved to the U.S. Um, where they're, they're, they learned English, or they grew up here and did study abroad, or they took, a, a, took foreign language but also then had to know foreign language for their job or to talk with, um, with the people at work. So that's how people, people learn a second language, and that's how your child is going to, to learn this other language system. And the best way to think about the language system you've chosen is as a language um, that you and the rest of your family and hopefully your whole school team need to immerse yourselves in, in as much as, as possible. 
Um, and to that end, I came up with um, this program that I call Motivate, Model, Move Out of the Way. And the idea of Motivate, Model, Move Out of the Way is to help us think both on a, a global sense of how my teaching language and on a very specific sense of how am I going to do this in this moment with this child to teach them language. And so the idea is we're, we're, we're going to find motivating circumstances that make kids want to participate and want to communicate. We're going to model or show kids how to communicate. And then we're going to give them the space to try it and make mistakes and learn how to communicate. Um, so I'm going to go into this in quite a bit more detail now, talking about motivate, model, move out of the way. Um, we've had a ton of success using this with parents and paraprofessionals um, and even therapists and teachers to really think about everything from specific interactions. How am I going to do this interaction in this 10 minutes? to work on this word or phrase or concept that I want to teach in language, um, or to, again, to think very globally about how are we going to teach language systems. All right, so we're going to talk first about motivating. How do we be motivating? How, what kind of motivating activities can we do with our, our kids? So first of all, um, being child-focused is, is one way to think about this. What grabs your child's interest? And this can change from, from day to day and minute to minute. You can, you know, when I have a session with a child that is an hour long or sometimes two hours long, the thing I start with isn't the thing I end with. What they're interested in over the course of the session, that interest changes, um, and I have to follow along with them. Um, so here are some examples of things that I've found that um, have motivated different kids. So you can see here um, so a child who's working, looking at a Door the Explorer app and using their speech device. This is a child who was um, very motivated by her favorite show, Door the Explorer. You can see a child um, on a horseback um, at hippotherapy who's using um, four core words here to be able to talk to the horse. I have a, a young lady I work with who, um, bacon was uh, enough to get her to do pretty much anything. It, um, first word she ever spelled was, was bacon. Um, this young lady down here, um, she has Rett syndrome, not Angelman syndrome, but um, you can see that we're coloring Easter eggs. So just doing a regular old family activity that most families do once a year. Um, you can't see very closely, but right here, Shannon's holding a $100 bill because we do what it takes. I had a kid who was very into washing machines, so we took lots of pictures of washing machines in lots of different places to talk about and write about. This young lady loves books um, and would love to read and talk about stories. I had another child who was very into uh, Blue's Clues. These are two apps that I love working with. Um, so this is Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus, and um, it's actually Don't Let the Pigeon Run this app. And this is uh, Toka Boca Hairstyle Me, which allows you to use a photograph of a person and then do their hair on the iPad. Any of these is a great motivating activity for, for an individual. Um, for kids with Angelin Syndrome and adults with Angelin Syndrome, the first thing we really have to remember is they tend to be what we call hyperacoustic, so they have excellent hearing, and they're also very tuned into their social um, cues around them. They um, part of that is anxiety. They're they're very focused on um, uh, what's going to happen next because they sometimes don't understand what's going to happen, so they are trying to anticipate that to make themselves feel a little better about feeling unsure. So you'll notice if you pick up your car keys, even in the next room, the sound of your keys might get your child with Angelman syndrome to react. Um, but any of those things is motivating. Um, I have kids I work with with Angelman syndrome who we can spend a good 20 minutes looking out the window. Um, and that's our motivating activity. And we talk about the people and the cars and the vehicles going by. Um, and that's, that's enough of an activity. It doesn't have to be a... You know, we don't have to make slime every every time we work. It doesn't have to be that in, intensive and that planned out. It's, it's enough to simply share an experience together and talk about it. Um, I have other individuals with Angelman syndrome who, you know, um, watching YouTube is a favorite. 
Um, I have to be careful though, some kids with Angelman syndrome, the minute you introduce videos or a screen, the session is over and there's no more talking, there's only watching. Um, so if your child is like that, maybe avoid the screens. Um, other kids can split their attention a little bit better. Um, there are lots of kids with Angelman syndrome who love sand or blocks or any of the anything where you can have anticipation of an experience and and then that experience happens. So kids with Angelman syndrome is sort of that play with anxiety again. They they love anticipating something is going to happen. So uh, a book where there's a repeating line that gets a big reaction might be a big hit or um, any toy where you do something and then something else happens, sort of a cause and effect toy, and the thing that happens gets a big result. Anything like that would be motivating. Um, for some kids, food is really motivating. Um, talking about food, looking at food, writing books about food. Um, I set up an individual with a teenager with Angelman syndrome with a Pinterest account, and at first it had all her favorite things, um, so Santa Claus and her favorite pop music stars and all sorts of different different categories we set up on Pinterest for her to scroll through because she loves scrolling through pictures. But, um, you know, on Pinterest, when you touch something, it adds that category to the thing it shows you more pictures of. So over time, it became just pictures of food in her Pinterest. It was just, you know, scrolling through all sorts of pictures of food, um, desserts and, and, and other stuff. Um, in the middle of the screen here, I have a picture of a, a pod book. Um, this is before the pod app existed. So I, this was an individual who was using pod who thought it was hilarious to drop something. And that was just the funniest thing on the planet. Gravity just made her laugh. Um, and so on this page in pod is the word drop. And we spent 20 minutes with me holding a piece of paper and her saying the word drop and then me dropping the paper and her laughing. And I gotta say by the end, she she knew the word drop. I have a, another child who loves it when I say stop. And I usually sign it to stop. And he'll hit on his proloco to go stop. And he loves for me to say it that way. And we're at this point sort of past him doing this as a activity. He knows what stop means. He knows how to activate it appropriately. But it became a bonding thing between us that that's our thing. Stop. And also up. He likes to say up. And we put our hands up. Um, anything like that can be motivating. You're focusing on what charms your kid. What gets your kid interested. Um, and you want to really focus on those things that are very interesting to them as times when you can naturally teach language. Now, if you have other children and you've, you know, you've taught that child to speak, you know that this is, this is what we do with kids to teach them language. When they look at something, so you're out in, in the world and your child sees a dog and they, they look at the dog or they point to the dog or they make an excited noise, you say, oh yes, that's a doggy, you see the doggy. And then you automatically, because you know your child, um, adjust what you're saying to their ability level. So if you have a very young child who, who points to a, a dog and gets excited, oh, yes, doggy, it's a doggy. You see the doggy. Um, but if your child's a little bit older, you might say, oh, yes, that is a very big dog, a big brown dog. Because your child's ready for more language and to do some, some adjectives. And you naturally get this. This is, we all sort of naturally know how to do this with, with kids, or we learn how to do it at the very least um, if we have young children who are learning language in our house. Um, and we're going to do the same things with our kids who have Angelman syndrome and are using a device. We're going to take the things they're interested in, and we're going to talk to them about those things. But instead of doing it verbally, or not instead of, but in addition to doing it verbally, we're also going to use their device. So if your child with Angelman sees a dog and points to the dog and gets excited, you will touch on their dog, uh, you will touch on the dog, you might go and touch the dog maybe, but you'll touch on their device, you see, oh yes, you see the doggy. And if your child is going to pay attention for a few more seconds and you've learned the system a little, you might touch, see animal's dog. Yes, you see the dog. Um, and then you'll naturally learn how to adjust for your child. So that might be the end of talking about the dog. 
or talking about the dog might go on for five more minutes and you're going to repeat. You see the dog. Yes, look at the dog. Yes, big dog. Um, but but that's, that's what every parent does. And, and you can all do this too, except you're going to also do it with their AAC system. Um, I love this video because it shows um, a child who has Angelman syndrome and he is um, playing with a ball. He and I are playing with a ball and we're simply rolling the ball into his empty shape short sorter um, and I'm modeling language. What you'll see is that I don't expect him to say anything back to me. Um, he's a, at this point, he's older now, but at this point he's an early language learner. He does have some knowledge of where some things are in his um, communication system. Um, but that's not my goal right at that moment. I'm not trying to get him to a, to give me language back. I'm simply trying to do something very motivating and then show him language while we do it. And I choose this video to show you because it is, um, it, it's so simple. It's not something I planned for. We were simply playing with the ball and started rolling it. And I just took that moment, that naturally occurring situation, and went ahead and used it as a, a time to be doing some, some language activities. Okay, whose turn is it? Whose turn is it? Is it my turn? Or is it your turn? Oh, you're giving? You're giving the ball to Kate. All right, here I go. Here I go. I'm going to do it again. Roll the ball. A one. A two. Oh, I I'm going to do it again. A one. Two, three. Oh, I did it. Clear. I'm giving the ball to you. Give. Here. Oh, no. Whoa. Oh, try again. Um, a little boy named Bodhi and you could see that we just did something that was very motivating to him and he really enjoyed it. Um, one other motivating activity I want to show you is this is Jessica's favorite food. Jessica had just um, gotten a new uh, talker, a new speech device and at this point she was um, mostly just touching pictures of food in the device because she, she loved to, to talk about her favorite foods, and who doesn't? So we spent quite a bit of time making a collage of her favorite foods, and, um, and her making the connection between when she touched the button, it meant something, and somebody understood that something. If she touched mashed potatoes, that I understood that, that she meant mashed potatoes. Um, it didn't necessarily mean I was gonna give her some mashed potatoes right then, but that she was starting to able be able to understand that the words could be used for different things. But it was within this very motivating activity of her um, talking about her favorite foods. Um, that was a couple of years now. Now Jessica and I are so far beyond this sort of very basic her touching food pictures and, and making a collage. And you know, she plays games with rules now, and she she tells about past events, and she does all this these other things. But this is where we started. We started with the, this very basic interaction. Of course, both in the video and in talking about Jessica's collage, you saw that I was modeling. Um, modeling is um, you know I was joking. I was I was modeling modeling. Um, I never knew I'd be a model, but here I am, modeling all the time. Um, 
There are other words for this. Aided language stimulation is one. Aided being um, language that, that has other parts are added to it or pictures added to it. Language um, being language and stimulation being something designed to, to get somebody interested. Partner augmented input, so we're the partner, augmented being the device, and input being we're giving the child input so that they um, can experience somebody using an alternative device with them and they can see how it's used. Um, all sorts of different names for it, um, but basically it comes down to modeling and put simply, it, it just means that you are going to use the talker to speak to the child. Now you hear us talk a lot about immersion. Immersion is the goal for modeling and it would mean that 70% of what you say is also said for the talker. Well, that's the goal. I've never seen any place um, that quite masters that every minute of every day. Um, and that's okay. Your, your goal is to model as much as humanly possible, as much as you can, without it um, interrupting your, your daily life in such a way that you can no longer function. Um, modeling will slow you down, which is good. Um, children, um, young children need to hear words at about 140 words per minute um, to help them understand. But, and that goes for other people who have difficulties understanding language. But we adults talk at 220 words per minute, um, which is too fast. Um, and when we model, we do slow down. Um, you may worry that you can't find the words you want. That's absolutely fine. Um, you show the child how to figure out where words are. That's the part of modeling is they understand that when you don't know where something is, you have to go looking for it. And sometimes you have to find another way to say it. Um, another thing that, that people worry about is that they just, they feel like they need to say every word that they speak, that they also have to model and you don't. You want to model one step above where your child is. So if your child is new to using a speech device and is not hitting anything really purposefully yet, then you just want to model one word at a time with purpose. If your child is using one word um, to say things with the talker, to say stop and go and eat, um, then you want to model two words. If your child is modeling two words, you want to model, if your child's using two words with a device, you want to model three. If they're using three words but the grammar is incorrect, you want to model three with correct grammar. You're just staying a step ahead. It's like the old joke about the teacher only has to read a chapter ahead in the book. Um, in modeling, you just want to model a step ahead. So don't get too caught up in being worried about if you can find something or if you can't find something and how quickly and saying every word and where's the and 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 the, although don't worry about it. You, you're just staying a step ahead of where your child. Now, why do, why do we do this? Why are we going to, to model? Um, so what I like to ask people is when do you stop talking to a baby, right? You, you bring a child home from the hospital and um, talk to that baby. And you know that baby's not going to talk back to you, yet you still talk to it. Um, you say all sorts of things that you, isn't really meant for them, but you're just talking to them. And then they're also surrounded by language in print and, and what they hear and what's on the TV and what's on devices. Um, and YouTube or whatever, they hear language constantly. Um, we need to try to replicate that for kids who are going to have language through an AAC system. So um, we give kids, babies, 12 to 18 months before we even expect them to say anything back. And when they do say something back, when we get a mama or we get a, a, a kind of sound, we then shake that, right? So they say, mama, mama, and they're just playing with their sounds. And we say, oh, yes, mama, mama. And that child says, oh, wait a minute, I get a reaction if I do that. And then so they try again, mama, mama, and imitate. And eventually they learn that mama gets a reaction, so they're going to say that. And over time, they learn mama is a specific person. Um, and this happens gradually over time, and it's what you're going to do with your AAC system too. You're just gonna bombard them with that. If they press a button, you're gonna act like they meant it, even if you're not so sure that they did yet. So if they see that it gets a reaction and you can shape it so they understand that pressing these buttons 
turns into language and it and it means something. Um, the other thing to remember is you not only talk to this child for 12 to 18 months before they say anything back, but you don't expect to have a conversation with them until they're three or four years old. You don't expect to stop really giving them input on language until they're seven. Um, and I don't know when you stop correcting grammar, but I have an 18 year old niece and I still correct her grammar. So um, you might give them 18 years of, of grammar instruction on the fly um, before you go ahead and, and stop doing that. So you're going to keep going. With, this is a long process. They're not, no baby comes home and talks next week or, or speaks in full sentences at 18 months. This is a long and gradual process. And, um, you know, it, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and you need to keep reminding yourselves of, of that and reminding your team of that, um, that you have to give the room to make the progress, but you also have to be patient um, and just keep giving input. It, it works. Um, we can give input to kids a, for a long time before we see anything back, and that's okay. Um, so, aided language stimulation is the strategy where the partner teaches symbol meaning and models language by combining their verbal input with the selection of buttons on their AAC system. So, this is from um, Gail Porter, who invented the pod books and apps. Um, this is from her trainings and presentations, which is when you have a child who is um, typically developing and will be verbal, they get spoken language coming in, and then you eventually get spoken language going out. But when you have a child who's going to use AAC, they get spoken language coming in, and they're not going to give you back verbal language. They're going to give you back aided language on the device, and it just doesn't compute. Um, so in the end, you want aided language coming in and aided language going out. Um, you want for them to see and hear AAC devices um, as the language in their environment and then give that back to you. The thing is that babies, infants, hear 4,380 hours of spoken language before we get that verbal speech back, right? But uh, AAC learners may only get 20 to 30 minutes a week at speech, or maybe they'll get a bit, bit more at circle. Um, but at that rate, at 20 to 30 minutes a week, it's going to take 84 years before that child gets 4,380 hours, um, which brings us back to our point that we have to model as much as possible and everybody needs to be in on it. Um, of course, if you can't get your school team to buy in and you're doing this at home alone, keep on it. Something is better than nothing. I have plenty of individuals I work with who um, learn to communicate at home and then we ask school to to carry it over um, because they didn't think they could at first and on the flip side is also true if you're a teacher or a speech therapist and you have families who who aren't carrying through um, you know know that your input is making a difference and everything you can do at school can add up to to better communication um, but it, of course, is much harder when, when not everybody is on board on, on either side, and I've seen both happen frequently. Um, so aided language stimulation is a best practice. Um, it's best practices or a best practice for all individuals learning how to use um, augmentative communication. The research on it goes back to 1988. So, you know, we are looking at some 30 years of research that tells us that we should be doing this. So if somebody um, ever acts like this is a surprise and why would you do it and they've never heard of it, the, the research base is there and it's very, very clear that aid, aided language stimulation or aided language input um, modeling, it works and, and the research does prove that. Um, it teaches communication on a speech device the same way verbal children learn language which means we have case studies of millions of children over thousands of years that tell us that this is how language develops in kids who are going to speak. Um, and it, it carries over to our kids who are going to use devices. Um, and the other thing is aided language stimulation teaches kids how to think about language. By watching us do things like say, you know, we're going to say out loud, um, I'm telling you something, I think that. So they hear that that process um of how language works which is 
you know, vitally, vitally important to um, to them owning the language system is is being able to think about language that that meta linguistic piece of of language. So the simple procedure for aided language stimulation is to gain the student's attention um, if you can, but that's not always possible. There are some kids who are not going to attend to what you're doing. They're not going to look at the device when you're modeling. And that's okay too. It's going to be more effective if they look, but if they don't look, you should still model. Remember, our kids with Angel One Syndrome are hyperacoustic, so they are listening and hearing. Um, they are going to learn language through hearing that pattern. So if they're not looking, just make sure you say where you're touching on the screen um, as you go along. Make sure you're saying, you know, I want things, food, snack. So that they hear all the buttons you're pressing. Um, they, they'll take it in auditorily. Um, you're going to use AAC to model the language as you speak. Um, you're going to start with one or two keywords and increase as both you and your child learn the system. Again, staying one step ahead of where your child is. And if you get stuck, you're going to speak out loud as you work through your reasoning of figuring out where the word is or what you're going to do instead. Um, so, you know, if you can't find, <laughs> today I had a mom who was looking for parasailing and um, they, they were at the beach and she, you know, she was teasing me that, you know, why didn't I have the word parasailing in there? Um, so we had to think of another way to say parasailing. We had to say, um, because they were at the beach, they do have a lot of beach words. So, you know, he go on surfboard with big kite, which is a lot of language, um, but it gave us a way to sort of talk about the, the person who was parasailing. And then we moved on and focused on that it looked like it was probably cold out there today because it's only about 70 degrees um, at the ocean up here in Massachusetts today. And, um, and the colors of the, of the parasailing um, parachutes. Um, but, you know, that process of working through what to, to say instead it is really vital and it teaches our kids to, to be persistent, not to give up if you can't find the words. So some things to, to think about to know, um, you wanna use nonverbal junctures to um, cue the child to, to look. So before you start modeling, you might wanna pause, you might want to hold the device in front of them so that they see it or move it closer to them. Um, you want to try to use these nonverbal junctures as much as possible to decrease the verbal distraction. Remember, our kids are very auditory. So we want to, you know, use as much pointing and gesturing as we can so that it's not as much competing input for them. And it really sets the stage for what we're going to do. So if we always hold up the device and big smile and point to the device and hold it out to them and then model, they'll learn, okay, this is when I pay attention so I can find out where a word is. Some other things you can do is you can use a flashlight or a laser pointer to point to symbols. You can use a pipe cleaner that you um, make a circle at the end or a bubble wand. Um, all of these are great ways to give visual attention to where you're, to where you're pointing. Um, Kids with uh, CDI or visual issues or who have developmental challenges, um, it says below eight months, I hate that phrase, but I took it right off the study, so it's not me, it's how the study was written. They may look at your finger um, instead of what you're pointing at, so using something else to, uh, to highlight a symbol might be a good idea. It also allows you to give some physical space between you and the child. Um, kids with disabilities, they're adults right next to them an inch away all the time. And, you know, they really need to, to learn how to have some space. I'm sure all of you who has had a very loving headlock um, would support the idea of a little more space sometimes. Um, so those are some things you can do to help. You can have puppets model, you can have toys model, um, video modeling, which will be in another um, AU course, is extremely effective in Angel Wind Syndrome. Um, having videos of kids um, that kids can watch of modeling is, is just a great way to teach language in, in Angel Wind Syndrome. Um, another thing to, to think about, I'm not going to spend much time on this, so it'll, it'll be another course at some point, 
but you can look it up if you're very interested. Um, this is more for the teachers out there and the, and the uh, speech therapists, but you can use something called the descriptive teaching method. Um, and that is simply asking things in a way that a child can answer with the words they have. Um, which means before you ask, of course, you never you never test before you teach. So when you're on that teaching part, you're going to model these core words. So if you're learning about landforms, um, uh, teaching a typical child, you might say, what landform is surrounded by water and expect the answer to be island? Um, but for a child with using a speech device, maybe you don't want to... Um, program in the word island if it's not there, or maybe you're really working on other core words and you want them to learn things like around as a concept. So you might say, oh, if we have an island, the water, where is the water? And they might, and then they can answer the water is around. Um, or you might say, what's on all sides of an island? And they can say water, and water, well, it is not um, a, a first level tier, tier one core word it is definitely a core word. So, um, but it's basically rethinking how you teach. Again, there's information about this out there. We'll do a course on it at some point. Um, and this is more for the teachers, but it's um, really to, to help people understand how do we do this when we're doing academic skills or in inclusion or um, in a setting where we want to be teaching academics. Um, another thing to, to think about is recasting. Um, recasting is when you repeat something back without the mistake. Um, so it's a, it's a form of modeling. It's like a, a you know level two modeling. <laughs> um, so maybe the child says to you more, and you say model back to them what more or I want more. So you're repeating it back while adding more information, or well um, fixing the mistake. So if you think about um, somebody who says, I ain't going to be doing that, right? And if a child said that, you might hear that and then say back to them, you're not doing that, right? So you just repeated it back without the mistake. You didn't explain it. You didn't add a ton of information. You didn't sit down for a grammar lesson. You simply said to them, the same thing they said back without the mistake. We're going to do the same thing, too, with our kids who use devices. So if they say something with the device, um, we'll either repeat it back longer or repeat it back without the mistake. Um, so that's information on modeling. Now let's think about the next step. So we have motivate. So we're going to do things that are fun and exciting and engaging. We're going to find those moments in our day and we're going to use them for language. And then we're going to model. And I gave you a ton of information, but the only thing you really need to think about is use their talker to talk to them. Um, you don't worry about the rest if it's too complicated. Just start by talking to them with their talker. One word at a time is fine and build. Finally, we're going to move out of the way. Now, what do I mean about that? Um, I mean it both literally as in back up <laughs> and I mean it figuratively. I mean it as gives kids space and time to learn language and experience it. Kids learn to talk by talking. Kids learn to use an AAC system by using it. Our modeling is incredibly important. Our talking to kids is incredibly important, but real language can't develop until they start using it themselves and finding out the power of it and what it means. So how do we move out of the way? How do we give them that, that powerful time and space to really learn and own language? First of all, we have to allow wait time, and then we have to allow more wait time. You're, you're going to wait. I work with a young lady who um, claps when we say a certain word, and I'll say that word to her, and I'll count how long it takes between me saying it and her clapping, and that tells me that's how much wait time she needs today. We're going to always have our device around. We're not going to say device, time is over, we're too tired to communicate, it's too heavy to carry, or... Um, no, we're, we're going to always have our language within arm's reach, um, hopefully even closer. Lots of individuals with Angelman syndrome wear their um, AAC devices in the harness or with a carry strap, um, but we're, we're going to always have our device there. That's part of moving out of the way because 
Um, otherwise, you have to stop everything you're doing, get in the child's space, and give them the device or give them the system. Having it there allows you to, to back off. We're going to use what we call an expectant pause, um, which is, I also call this the, the therapist pause. It's when you look at somebody and you make it a slightly uncomfortable silence. You sort of and they want to fill that silence. Now, for some kids, being too expectant is anxiety provoking and they won't be able to give anything back to you. Um, for those kids, you might want to use a distracted pause where you're going to um, sort of put out, you know, I wonder what you think about that and then look away or, or you know, pick up your phone for a second to give them that space to, to respond. Um, we're going to use the prompt hierarchy, which I'm going to talk about in a second which allows us to understand, um, be very sequential about our understanding of, of how we in, entice kids to use their talkers. We're going to um, allow kids, we're going to physically back up and give space. Um, whenever I give this presentation in front of individuals who use AAC, that's the one they get excited about, is somebody saying that adults need to back off. Um, kids feel like Kids who use devices feel like there's some, always somebody right on top of them, and you know, having some physical space is a good thing. We're going to let the user talk to new people or new places, try out using their device anywhere they go. Um, we're going to just let life unfold and be ready for, for what the, your child or student says to you. Um, and you're going to encourage talking to yourself. Um, this I'll talk, I talked about this a little bit before, and I'll talk about this in another session, but this is called an um, internal dialogue. Um, and it's an important part of mastering language is the ability to talk to yourself in your head. Um, but first, you sort of need to talk to yourself out loud. And for kids who use devices, that means talking to yourself with your device. Um, and just reducing the pressure that we put on kids to be able to participate. Um, the next piece I'm going to talk about is the prompt hierarchy. And again, I apologize for how the um, screencasting software is sort of cutting off the image here. Um, so the one on the left is sort of the, the understood um, prompt hierarchy for special education and um, in behavioral um, settings, ABA kind of settings. Um, so it starts with... Uh, a natural environmental cue. So you might think that a natural environmental cue, uh, if we're going to talk about having somebody ask for food, the natural environmental cue is they feel hungry. Um, then the next thing might be a gesture. So you may point to their device, device, gesture to their device, and then you may hint to have something you want to ask for. And then you may tell, so you say, um, you need to say, I want a snack. And then you're going to model. Now, this is a different model than aided language stimulation. Aided language stimulation is something you do all the time. This model here um, on, the, on the left is a specific model for them to copy you. It's an imitative model, so it's meant for them to imitate. And then you might put hands on and um, maybe move their hand um, or do hand over hand or hand under hand to get them to do it. Um, I've spent, I spent many, I've been in this, this field over 20 years, and I spent a lot of time using this prompt hierarchy, and then eventually um, I ended up rewriting a prompt hierarchy for individuals who um, are learning language on a speech device and who have apraxia, which is um, a motor planning problem from the brain to any part of the body for intentional um, movements, which would include speech and using a speech device. So my revised prompt hierarchy, which I've, I've found to be incredibly effective, is that we have this sort of umbrella of always using native language stimulation. This is the umbrella that all other AAC learning takes place under. And then we're going to create motivation. So we already talked a lot about that. And then we're going to use an inviting or expectant pause. Now notice between each of these levels is the word wait. So you're going to create motivation and wait. See if they say something. And then you're going to pause and wait for them to say something. Then you might use an indirect um, visual cue. So you might push the talker closer to them. You might gesture at a section of the screen. Um, you might shine a light on their communication book. 
And if then you're going to wait and see if they say anything. Um, and if they still haven't participated, um, you're going to give them a direct visual cue. So point to or shine the flashlight on exactly what you think they might want to say. Um, the catch here is that it's what you think they might want to say. You don't know they want to say that. You don't know they're, they're interested in that. Um, and we always sort of have the, the possibility of making communication about us and what we're demanding instead of about what the child wants to say. Um, and the minute we make it about us and our demands and our ideas of what kids should say, we run the risk of making their device something they hate because it's not for talking to us and sharing their, their in, in the world with us. It's for um, following demands and doing what you're told. And that's not motivating for, for most kids. So we, we need to be really careful around here um, of, you know, are we sure that this kid wants to say this? And let's phrase things in a way that says, you might want to say this. You could say this instead of, you know, say this now. Um, and again, even with your direct verbal cue, you, you, you just, you want to be careful. And then you might give a non-directive model. So again, you instead of an imitative model, I'm going to do this and you're going to copy it, which is the model on the, on the one on the left. Your non-directive model will simply be saying something like, you might want to say, or some people would say, or I think you're thinking, um, just and then showing them the message they could say. Now, here's where the, the two prompt hierarchies major, are majorly different. In the revised one, this is where we stop. If we give a non-directive model and the child doesn't say what we want them to say, we move on. Um, we increase motivation, we go back to the top of the prompt hierarchy, we rethink what we're doing, we think about did they really want to say the thing we thought they wanted to say, um, but we, we don't put hands on and make them say anything because communication is always a choice, right? If the words aren't coming from within us and it's not communication, it's just following orders. Um, but with the, the old or the the usual typical prompt hierarchy, it, it does move to those physical prompts. And some people do want to still use them. Lots of kids with Angelin syndrome want you to be a, a human stylus. They want to hold your hand and they want you to point. And that's usually because your hand is, is steadier and it's also a form of early communication. When a child sort of brings you something um, to communicate something, they're doing the same thing. You're, they're bringing you to the picture. Um, for most kids, if you just sit further away, that won't happen as much. Um, but again, them taking your hand and using you as a stylus is a lot different than you taking their hand and using them as a stylus. Um, so you really want to be thinking about, you know, how, how much do you want to push here? Um, and again, when we're talking about move out of the way as far as physically give space, if you're physically touching a child, you're not very far away. You're not giving them the room that they need to sort of grow. And again, this is something that within the field is highly debated and, and you know, something you're going to want to talk about with your family and your teams. And, and do you want to be entering somebody's space or not? Do you want to be forcing them to say something or not? And um, deciding what you're you're going to do in your family. Um, I prefer the, the no physical touching and the giving the kids lots of space for them to say what they think, even if what they think is not right or what I think they're going to say. Um, I, I think it's important that they have that chance. Um, so that is, wraps up our, our, our course for today. We covered a lot of material in a very short time. I do want to show you this um, Facebook group called AAC through Motivate Model Move Out of the Way. We have over 6,000 members now, um, probably pushing 7,000 members. It's a very active group. It's teachers, parents, therapists, all the stakeholders. We have a even lots of, maybe not lots, but we have plenty of AAC users who, who step in and give, give their opinion on things. Um, it's a really welcoming and wonderful community, um, and uh, anyone who's taken this course, I invite you to come join it and, um, and find people to talk about AAC through Motivate Model and Move Out of the Way um, there and anything else about AAC. Um, I hope you'll join us for other courses, um, and have a great day.